let's talk about small scale grain production. Um, so my background, I spent many years working in agronomic production and research up in Pennsylvania. And um, came to really love and appreciate these crops, which um, in recent memory, these crops have been only within the reach of like big ag, right? So people who um, have the capital to have the equipment, typically, um, maybe they inherited it or whatever, and it's been out of reach of like the small landholder or the new and beginning farmer, that kind of thing. And so because we don't totally get all of our calories from the vegetables that we can grow in our garden, I think it's important that we know how to grow these crops to help meet our own nutritional needs and for a whole lot of other reasons that, you know, maybe you're trying to supplement your animal feed if you're a livestock producer or something like that. I'm really excited about the potential for growing grains on a small scale. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about that today. So for the first little bit, I'd like to just go ahead and explain a little bit of background and hear from you guys with what you're thinking about. Um, then we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the crops. We're gonna um, talk about a selection of crops, uh, a little bit of their background, a little bit, a bit about their management, and then dig into management more in detail later. Um, talk about crop rotation, how to use cover crops in a crop rotation with grain crops. Uh, specifically with regard to like management details. Um, what to expect for small acreages or small plots, you know, when you're a sub one acre. And then thinking about how efficiently you can grow these things on a given amount of land compared to other types of crops. And so I'm gonna make my pitch for growing legumes as a protein source. Uh, and we'll hear more about that in a little bit. And then also about supplementing feed uh, with what you can grow at home. Then hopefully we'll get to walk out to the field and spend a lot of time talking about management because I think that that's like the more interesting stuff, the fun part, um, is actually working with the crops and learning what works and what doesn't. I'd say like in my experience, I, so I worked in like organic no-till for a very long time, grain production. 95% of what I learned was what not to do and so I'd like to at least try to share some of that. When I say grains, I'm not talking just about wheat, barley, those kind of things, things that go into bread or beer. When I say grains, I'm thinking about anything that is a seed crop that you harvest. So that could be corn, that could be soybean, that could be dry bean, that could be lentils, that could be sorghum, you name it. Um, the whole slew. And the idea is it's a seed crop um, that's consumed by you or an animal. So generally these are broken down into the cereals, which are what we think of as uh, wheat, barley, rye, triticale, all those fun things, but also corn, sorghum, right? So grass family. Anything that's a grass family that's a seed crop, we call it a cereal. And there's legumes, we all know legumes, peas, pe peas and beans. Um, and then there's this category called the pseudo cereals and that's because they don't really fit anywhere else. Uh, they're not legumes and they're not in the grass family, but they're a lot like cereals, so we call them pseudo cereals. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then, you know, I think it's a good idea to talk about oilseed crops. They generally are in their own category and they're not referred to as grain, but that's like a silly distinction. I'm gonna talk a little bit about oilseed crops. I haven't worked with any of them except canola and flax a tiny bit, so I, I can't tell you a whole lot about their management, but I think it's a good idea to have these on your radar because they offer a lot of benefits. Um, okay, so why are we trying to grow grains on a small scale? I think that's a... Uh, an important question if you consider that um, compared to large scale production, it's rather inefficient in terms of time or what else you could possibly grow in that area that might bring in a little bit more money. Um, so I, I think because historically, if we, think, if we take the long view and think way back about human evolution and where we came from, grains are kind of what got us over the hump from an evolutionary perspective and they were the first crops to be domesticated um, staple food throughout the millennia, right? So we have a lot of history with them. Um, they, you know, are great for providing a lot of calories and in the case of legumes, a decent protein source. And so um, we've developed a lot of culture, food culture around them. And so I, I would like to kind of maintain that on the, for the small scale landholder, right? So somebody who's doesn't have all the equipment but might want to like try to continue working with the history that's in grain crops um, and also provide uh, nutrition for themselves and their family, right? There's also potential if you're a farmer trying to make a living at it that you can do some high-end retail of legumes. 
So for example, I have a friend who lives over in California and they're selling uh, dry beans at the farmer's market for like 15 bucks a pound, which is a little bit crazy, right? But you know, there's an example of how you might be able to make it work if you're a farmer and you were comfortable asking that for your beans. You can, okay, so I've mentioned this, right? So you can reduce feed costs. Um, if, so, so I've actually spoken with a lot of egg producers who do not, who want to produce organic eggs, do not want to pay for the feed costs because organic feed is really expensive. And so they're trying to do that in-house, get their crop certified, feed it to the chickens. Um, and what they're up against is just not having like the, the mechanization to make it time efficient for them. And so we're going to get it a lot of that today. And so I've kind of brought, touched on this a little bit, but um, if you can take a step back and think about uh, all of the food that you might consume in a year, and if that meets your nutritional needs, then how can you grow that food that you eat in a year? How can you meet your nutritional needs with what you grow? Um, I think that grains can fit that and that you can do it efficiently. And you'll hear a lot more about that in a little while. Okay, so if we kind of like try to make sure our perspective is correct, at least from where I'm standing, I think it's important that you accept that small scale grain production is never going to be as efficient as large scale ag production um, from, the, from the perspective of like the pounds of grain that you can get from your hour of work, right, at, over the course of a season. It's just never, you're never going to be able to touch it. And so um, this is not intended to be discouraging, but just to make a point that if you were fully mechanized and this is pounds of grain per hour invested, you get a lot of grain for each hour. And then as you work your way down to completely unmechanized, say you didn't even have a push seeder or a rototiller or a mower or anything, and you know, it's a pretty poor return and probably there might be some people out there who are living like that. But what I'm pointing out here is that just totally forget about these guys. Just don't worry about it because that's, that's not the right way to think of it. I'm guessing that most of, most of you are in minimally mechanized or you know, you might have a tractor but you don't have all the grain processing equipment and then you just make do. And so if you're in these two categories, that's kind of where we want you. Or maybe, sure, we can include you too in the bottom. Um, with the idea that just don't worry about the, in, the relative inefficiency because those guys are producing food for way more people than they need to compared to you, right? Okay, it's not also, like I mentioned, it's not going to be as efficient as growing vegetables uh, from a, a dollars per acre perspective. If we just accept these things and, and consider it just sort of a labor of love, trying to cut animal feed costs or, you know, meet your nutritional needs, that kind of thing, then maybe this will work for you. Okay, so however, it'll also help you diversify your crop rotation. If you are a vegetable grower, then you can plug in these new crops, right? And they, will, they can extend your, uh, your crop rotation, they can make it more diverse, which has its own benefits, right? From like a disease and pest, insect pest perspective. Um, and provide a, a different stream of revenue as well. Um, I'll, I'll keep hitting on this, but I'll go into more detail later. I won't say much about it now. Um, growing what you can eat. Um, we'll talk more about the food system and growing what you can eat later, uh, reducing feed cost and improving your soil nutrient management. And what I mean specifically by that is that they have a relatively low potassium demand compared to vegetables. Potassium is often a limiting nutrient on organic farms, so um, it can kind of help regulate potassium management or, or perhaps other soil nutrients. Okay, so before we dive into the crops, I want to stop right there, and I'd really like to go around the room and get some introductions, um, and just kind of tell me who you are and why you're here, because I'd, I'd really like to know where you're coming from and what you'd like to get out of this. Okay, my name is Joel Warshaw, and I'm hoping to uh, have a small farm someday, and so I'm here to learn these good tips. Yeah, um, I'm Don Johnson, and uh, just <clears throat> kind of looking uh, for how to do something like this, basically by hand, you know, that up and turn into a bigger operation. So it seems like it might be useful. So. Uh, my name is Whitney and we do have a small farm. Um, right now we're just doing vegetables and we'd like to add some of this in. I grow vegetables and uh, I have chickens and I'd like to grow some grains for the chickens. Good. I'm Janice Parsons and I'm her lady. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're here. <laughs> We have a, a small homestead and we kind of have dabbled in growing some of these green crops and we really would like to get some good information about how not to fail at it. 
uh, Ray Carrion, my wife Donna. Donna's the uh, farmer. <laughs> I can build things. And uh, we've got a hobby farm. We do vegetables, a lot of fruits, way down in South Georgia. But we'd like to learn what we can about grains. Gotcha. Christine Collings, I'm starting up a small farm in Candler, two acres. I'm Ron, my wife Beth, uh, have a small farm down in central Georgia, so we're a little farther north from you all. Uh, I'll be retiring from a permanent job later this year, looking to do something really helpful for the area. So we've grown vegetables in the past in the vegetable garden. So let's see what we do with grains. We think that's a very important part of the uh, balance. I'm Chelsea, um, and I've been working with a bakery, trying to grow out different, um, doing a lot of seed trials and seeing what does well here and working on selecting exciting seed and working with exciting like rare varieties that we really like for flavor. Um, and I'm on two acres and yeah, doing it on the east coast is definitely different <laughs> than doing it on the west coast playing with rain. So. Mm -hmm. I'm Michael um, and we're both just about to uh, start leasing land. Um, We've been working for a farm where we're going to lease land an acre down the road and we had hopes to put in a crop of wheat for the people they work for, um, but we're going to, or just interested generally in growing grains. So, yeah. Oh, Anna. Same thing. <laughs> Bill and Carol. Um, we also have a little bit of land and are making a lot of painful transition to farming. And <laughs> Grain production in, in particular for uh, animal feed and oil seed and the soil management aspects. Okay. So let's start with let's start at the top of the list. Let's talk about cereals. The the main players here that we're going to be talking about is corn, sorghum, small grains. Oh, and by the way, I didn't explain uh, a little a little bit about small grains earlier. So small grains is a term that's often used to describe. Um, wheat and its relatives, right? So close relatives, rye, barley, and so forth. Um, but the term is a little bit ambiguous, so it, it often gets thrown around and other grains like sorghum get included in there, that kind of thing. But so when I say small grains, I'm talking about these cool season crops like wheat, rye, and barley. Um, so the players in there, wheat, rye, barley, oats as well. Oats is a, a great crop. I'm a big fan of oats. We'll talk more about why in a little while. Um, and then there, also coming on the market, and becoming more popular recently are the ancient wheat varieties, quote unquote ancient. Um, so we're talking like Spelt and Emmer, and they're just different species of triticum, um, different kinds of wheat species. So um, they have really unique flavor profiles, pretty rich in flavor, and so uh, bakers are very interested in working with them. But they have their own set of challenges um, because they have holes in them, unlike uh, wheat, which is easy a lot easier to work with. Um, and then rice as well. So I, I haven't worked with rice, but I do know that there are some people not too far away from here who do grow rice and are interested in trying to make that work. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about rice because I haven't worked with it, but just know that's kind of on the, the radar of things that might be able to work for you, depending on what you're going for. Corn, and we'll see a little bit more about like the specifics in a little while, but corn is a pretty amazing crop, so it kind of has a bad rap because so, so much acreage is planted to it and it's like really resource intensive. Um, but it's a pretty impressive crop. It is like by far the most pr uh, productive grain that we can grow here in the States. Most of the vast majority of what's grown in the States is either for animal feed or for ethanol. There's a very small sliver of that that goes to food. Um, if that were to be a larger portion, it would be a much more meaningful crop, I think. Um, a larger portion of food instead of feed if we kind of adjusted the proportions. Um, perhaps reduce its acreage, of course, but um, it, it's an impressive crop and I don't want anybody to hold it against me for including it here. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, sorghum is a really interesting crop. This here is grain sorghum, so it has this tight head. Um, all the sorghum is bundled up at the top, but sorghum is a cool species to work with because there are dual purpose varieties that can also be used uh, for their cane. Uh, for making molasses. And so out in the field we had a dual purpose variety planted that hopefully we'll get to go see. Um, 
we had a few issues out in that field and so not a whole lot of it is left standing. Most of it was harvested already. But um, if we do get a chance to go over there, you'll get a, a chance to look at that. Um, and it is second in the list for product productivity uh, among all these crops that we're going to talk about. These two are warm season crops that grow in the summer. Um, all, the, all these small grains right here are cool season crops. And then the rice is a warm season crop as well. There are a bunch of different kinds of wheat, as uh, probably a lot of these bakery folks know, right? So there's soft wheat. Um, that's grown over the winter, and that's a lower protein, softer kernel, then there's hard wheat, higher protein, harder kernel. Both of those have their spring and their um, winter varieties, and so some of them you'll plant in the fall, and they'll grow, well, they'll, they go dormant over the winter, and then they, they come back alive in the spring and produce a really nice crop. Where it's very cold, which doesn't apply to North Carolina or Georgia, um, people grow spring wheat because it doesn't overwinter. It can't make it through the winter. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between the spring varieties in a little while and the warm and cool season. Um, rye, I think everybody's familiar with rye, often used for bread or beer, but not nearly as much as uh, wheat or barley. That's the only picture I put up of these small grains because they all look the same. Um, but oats here, it has its, its own inflorescence type, right? So it's got these um, little seeds that kind of are loose on the stalk and hang downward, whereas these are all kind of like tied up in a head and they point upward. In addition to kind of having its own growth habit and being a little bit different looking, um, it's also considerably higher in protein. So it's a very attractive grain for uh, chicken producers and that kind of thing. And when I, when I talk about high protein, I'm not talking about like legume high protein, but like high teens, maybe like 15 to 20% at most. Um, whereas these are like, you know, corn is 10% protein, super low. Rice is 10% protein. Um, the wheats are, 11 to 15. The hard, hard wheats, which are for bread, are higher protein, around 15%. Soft wheats, which are used for making like pastries and stuff like that, are lower in protein. Uh, and I think the important di distinction there is that gluten is one of the main proteins that allows for good bread making. So higher content, better bread. Cereals are the highest yielding among all these crops. They're really impressive. Um, they, because they're grasses, they have this incredible ability to tolerate like a really wide variety of environmental stresses, including like being very wet or relatively dry. Um, especially warm season grasses. So warm season grasses are called C4 plants. I don't know if anybody's heard that term before, but it's its own special kind of photosynthesis where they're a little bit more drought tolerant. And they're just, I mean, C4 plants are um, doing amazing things for us, in my opinion. Um, Okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about warm and cool season. So, again, warm season crops are planted in the spring, late spring, early summer. They're frost sensitive. Corn can tolerate light frost, but um, most warm season cereals can't. Uh, and they, you know, they grow and mature over the summer, harvested in the fall. Whereas cool season crops are fall planted or sometimes spring planted and harvested in the early summer. And so when they are fall planted, you can harvest them earlier, which is great because it opens up a wider um, window for planting something later in the summer. So you can actually double crop really well when you, grow, when you use fall planted cereals, so winter cereals or winter whatever crop. We'll talk about that uh, for other crops as well. Um, so things to consider when you're growing warm, ver when you're thinking about growing warm versus cool season is how that's gonna plug into your crop rotation. So <clears throat> if you, if you can get it planted in the fall and we're talking about growing wheat, then you should. Otherwise, if you have to plant it in the spring, if you don't, whatever crop doesn't come out early enough in the fall and you can't get wheat planted on time, then you might be forced to plant in the spring and then spring varieties that are available for that might be sort of subpar or actually, especially down in the, the warmer areas, um, spring crops do not do well. It just gets too hot too quick and they don't really set any seed. So, it's really important that you consider crop rotation when thinking about alternating between cool and warm season or figuring out how to plug these in. Um, also affects yields. In general, warm season crops are higher yielding. Um, and more importantly, fall planted crops are higher yielding than spring planted crops for these cool season ones. Um, and that's just because, simply because they have more time in the ground. So they do, they, they establish better. Um, <clears throat> also, and I think this is a very interesting uh, 
distinction, for whatever reason, warm season crops have a higher nitrogen demand, but a lower potassium demand compared to cool season crops. Um, the potassium demand of cool season crops is like almost equal to that of vegetables. It's surprisingly high, and I don't, re I don't actually really understand why. My suspicion is that they have higher nutrient content, but I don't know the details about that. Um, flip side of that, lower nitrogen demand of cool season, but higher potassium demand. What makes a cool season crop grow in the spring is that it's overwintered, and this is called vernalization. So it experiences a certain amount of cold, and um, so you have to be careful that if you do grow a winter crop and you think, oh man, I just ran out of time in the fall, I'll just put this seed in in the spring, you have to be very careful about the varieties you use because some of them require to be in the ground over the winter. So there are actually like spring adapted ones and then winter adapted ones. Does that make sense? So some that you have to plant in the fall, some that you can plant in the spring but could also plant in the fall and maybe get away with it if the, if the winter wasn't too hard. Um, so for example, one of our guys out here this past year planted spring barley as a cover crop in the fall expecting it to die and it overwintered um, and became a weed later on. So you expect it to survive, you know, as like a worst case scenario if you do plant a spring one. But do not expect a spring planted winter crop to set seed, if that makes sense. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about development and growth stages and when to harvest and that kind of stuff. So this is a graph, you don't actually have to be able to read it, but just like the general course of cereal development, this is described by this guy named Zadek. He developed this 1 to 100 scale of its growth stage. So when they germinate, <coughs> let's just say we're talking about a, a fall cereal because it's going to be a little bit different for summer ones. But when they germinate, the first thing that they do is they try to grow out a lot of shoots, right? And this is called tillering. Maybe you've heard this term before. Um, so they try to maximize shoots going into winter so that when spring comes around they can just jump up and make as many babies as they want or as they can. That's like their goal, right? So tillering is this first stage and then let's say this is winter. Then after that in the spring when things green up and start growing again, um, this is the stem elongation phase and if you were to walk out in a field at a few different times during the spring you can observe these different growth stages that are important for uh, you know, when you should time your fertilizer application or be thinking about insect control and things like that. Uh, and one of, the, one of the main ones is called the flag leaf stage. And so that's when it puts out this, it's kind of like its final leaf before it puts the head out and it's just this leaf that sort of sticks out sideways a little bit more than the other ones. So they call it a flag leaf. And then you'll see the head of the, uh, the flower head start to poke through. And for whatever reason, that's called the boot. I guess this looks like a boot upside down. Um, so that's called boot stage. And these are two important stages for being aware of, or maybe, maybe just before them, being aware of putting out more nitrogen if they seem to need it, that kind of thing. Um, because this is when all the action starts happening in terms of nutrient suck up. Um, and then you do have to be very careful about these delicate heads in here. So let's just say you're thinking about weed control. You planted your, your wheat and it's grown up in the spring, but something got to jump on it. Some weed or a weedy cereal from a couple years ago. Um, you have to be aware of where this little seed head is in there because you can go through there with a mower set real high and you can mow out the, the weed if it's above it. But if you clip off this head by chance, then you're out of luck, right? But so there are weeding opportunities that you should be aware of, but just be very, very careful um, if you are going to go down that road. So being aware of these, um, growth stages can be helpful for management. Okay, so then of course, seed head comes out, flowers, set seed. Um, let's just assume you get good pollination, good fertilization, then your seed head starts to dry down. And so, um, then, you're, then you're thinking about harvesting that grain. So it's actually not very easy to tell at what moisture content your grain is at. So what you wanna be sure to do is not harvest your grain when it's too wet. Right? So it's not going to store well and it also um, gets kind of smushed as it goes through all the processing equipment and you have this unattractive grain, people not, might not want it. But the most important aspect is that it doesn't store well. So there are very few visual cues to tell how ready it is, except that you can basically gauge maturity by how hard the kernels are. And so, um, actually, let's back up to this stage. Um, when we are in 
this ripening stage, it's unfortunate that this is all kind of condensed into one thing, but if you've ever eaten sweet corn or messed around with seed heads of wheat or whatever, they go through this stage where at first they're real milky, they're kind of watery, you can squish them. Um, and then as they start to dry down and become more starchy, that starch starts to fill into the seed, it becomes doughy. And so that's called the milk stage and the dough stage. Um, and then after that, when it starts to dry down is when you can start feeling with your fingernail how dry it is. And basically, when you can, if you have to press really, really hard to make an indentation on that seed, then you can assume that you're good to go on moisture level. Um, and the plant should be giving you, you know, the, the signal that it's dry based on how brown it is, basically. Um, if you leave it in the field too long, it starts to rot uh, or it can germinate, you know, that kind of thing. So you do have to kind of be careful about timing harvest um, and be aware of moisture levels. Of course, if you were really invested in it, you could buy a moisture meter um, or you could just harvest seed and you could do the thing where you weigh it, stick it in the oven, dry it, weigh it again, like calculate the moisture content. But it is fairly safe to use the, the press method um, to gauge maturity and when you can harvest. Now, corn is kind of a different story, right? So all these other grains that we're talking about, they kind of live out on these exposed seed heads. They're out in the open, but corn is in a husk. Um, so it has its own kind of thing going on anyway. It's on a cob and it's kind of wrapped up in a husk. So it's a little bit different. Um, so let's, let's jump into that real quick. So this is the stage where you eat it as sweet corn. This is called the blister stage or the milk stage. Um, and then once it starts to kind of fill these, these um, Corn kernels get larger, they get fatter. This is the dough stage right here. And then once it starts to dry down, they have these little dents on the outside. It's called the dent stage, right? And then you can start to tell how close you are to maturity when you start seeing dents by actually opening up the cob like this. And then you see this white line that kind of goes around the middle of all those right there. It's called the milk line. And that's actually a progression. It starts out here and it works its way in as like the quote unquote milk diminishes and then the starch fills that milk line marches down toward the cob, toward the cob middle. And so you can, any, on any day, once, once you're at about this stage, you can go out and check how close you are to maturity by just breaking that cob open and checking your milk line. Um, and then when the milk line gets all the way down, the corn cob, act, I mean the corn kernel actually cuts itself off from the cob and forms this, basically all these little cells right here at the tip of the thing, they die and they form this black layer. And so this is called black layer. Once you reach the stage, you, can start thinking about harvesting, but not until then. This is physiological maturity. Anytime before that, don't even think about it. Once you hit it, you can start monitoring moisture and using the same uh, dent press method. Works really well for that. If you split open, actually, let me go grab a cob really quickly. We have one right here. So if you can see this, um, this one has that, what looks like a milk line on this side, but this one doesn't. This is the side that you, this is actually kind of confusing. It came like this. Um, this is where you would look for the milk line. And then this one is actually the embryo. There's like the embryo that's always tucked up on this side of the seed. And so this one doesn't actually change, right? This is the embryo, but it just illustrates the point that that's what the milk line would look like. No milk line on this one. So here's the deal. Whenever you break, if you break open your cob, look at the part that's not attached to the plant, right? So break it open, look at this one, and definitely not this one. So that's just a little bit about Growth and development, and maybe how it can apply to you thinking about harvesting. Hot, so cereals have a really high nitrogen demand, especially relative to legumes. Um, corn, we all know, is a nitrogen sucker, and so if you're trying to go grow a good corn crop, people usually say you need a pound of nitrogen for every bushel that you're trying to grow. So you can do that math on whatever scale you're working on, but most of my units here are pounds per acre throughout this talk, and so um, corn is going to be that, the big guy who needs a lot, of, a lot of nitrogen. You can grow this much nitrogen with a cover crop, with a legume cover crop. It'll be challenging to get all of that nitrogen to the corn crop because it has to decompose. So often when growing corn, especially like if you're an organic grower, you'd have to be thinking about the long view and having like a lot of organic matter in your soil breaking down continuously or supplementing with something like sodium nitrate. Um, which has its own set of restrictions if you're organic. Okay, so for sorghum, still, uh, you know, this is a, a warm season cereal, high, still a high nitrogen demand.
at 100 pounds per acre. Um, so a little bit less than a pound of nitrogen per bushel, but still pretty high. Small grains, I mean, basically cut corn in half. We're talking 60 pounds. I mean, th this varies because yields vary. I should also say that the nitrogen that you should be thinking about having available in the soil is all dependent on what yield you want to get. So you put down more, you get up, you get more back up to a certain point. Despite being very high yielding, they have a relatively low nutritional value from like a what I want to eat perspective, not if I'm an animal or if I'm starving. Um, so they are relatively low in protein. So here's a, here is a table sort of, sort of summarizing nutritional and yield data, right? So corn, sorghum, small grains, and I put oats out here separately. Um, th these are the, just the wheat, rye, barley, small grains, and I put oats separately because it has a higher protein content. Um, so pounds per acre, I don't know if you can see this in the back, 9,000 for corn, 2,500 for oats, pretty high yields, um, but low protein contents, 10 to 14%, with the exception of oats, which is in the high teens, which is why I really like oats. Um, and fat and carbohydrates, we don't really need to pay attention to, except that you can note that they're really high in carbohydrates, um, which is why we grow them to provide energy to whoever wants to eat them, animals or us. But of course, they're valuable to us because they can provide a lot of food um, they have like some pretty cool culinary value, right? If you like to eat bread um, or whatever sort of corn products or whatever else. Um, and you know, they're, they're nutrient dense or excuse me, energy dense for feeding animals. So you can get a pretty good return from, from an acreage perspective if you do feed cereals to your animals. Although I'm not necessarily advocating that. Um, okay, so let's change gears and talk about legumes. Legumes are a totally different beast, very different management. Um, and kind of like they, they are sort of a counterpoint to a lot of the things I talked about with cereals. So let's jump into that. So there are warm season kinds and there are cool season kinds. So we got dry beans and other fasciolus species. Fasciolus is the dry bean species. So we got um, common bean and runner bean are the most common ones you might know. Um, and then soybean, everybody has probably seen fields and fields of soybeans. Um, Soybeans are pretty unique in that they have a really, really high protein content compared to all other grain crops, um, including legumes. And they, but they, and they also have a really high oil content, which makes them like especially useful to be grown as an animal feed, which is why things are the way they are. Um, I'm sorry, not to be grown as an animal feed, but to be processed first to get the oil out of them, and then you have a really high um, soybean meal even higher in protein, that's why we feed them to animals like we do. Um, but also that protein can be a source of human nutrition as well, uh, so I think that they're an important thing to include when you're thinking about growing grains. Okay, so uh, the, the final one, there, there are a lot of warm season legumes as you can imagine. Um, there, it's a super diverse family and people eat all kinds of them all over the world. But um, ones that you probably know well are black eyed peas, which is a type of cow pea. There are other types of cow peas. Um, and also other Vigna species like mung bean, azuki bean, those kind of things, all in that uh, Vigna genus. And they're very, very productive. Um, they grow these nice, really small grains that cook well, cook up quickly, um, and are tasty as well. So cool season legumes, these guys don't get a lot of attention in my opinion. So we're talking about peas. Um, they can be fall planted or spring planted, kind of depending on where you are. I think that in the Carolinas and southward, we're, we're talking about fall planting because things warm up too quickly in the, in the spring and summer. Um, this is a picture of a yellow pea. Yellow peas are very productive. As are green peas, there's really only two kinds, um, which is kind of interesting. How little attention I think breeders have given to peas and other cool season legumes. Um, but it's a, a high yielding crop, high, relatively high protein content, and I, I happen to really like it, also makes a great hummus. Um, lentils, lentils are a really cool little crop, uh, a cool but wimpy one. And so they're, they're a lot like hairy vetch, if you've ever worked with hairy vetch, um, they're, but except they don't vine, they really only stay like knee high at best. Um, they're not competitive with weeds, they don't yield very much, but I really appreciate them because they're um, very nutritious, they have this great nu nutrition profile, and they cook very quickly. So. They have those benefits to them. 
Um, so if you were thinking about, and they also don't have very much disease resistance as well. Um, if you were thinking about lentils, I would uh, advise caution, but it's worth a shot. Chickpeas as a, a final one. Chickpeas are really interesting, of course, making hummus out of these. Um, they have a really cool looking plant and the seeds look sort of alien when they're developing in there. It's, it's a neat crop, but also equally susceptible to uh, disease like lentil is, um, especially because they're cool season crops. They don't like having their feet wet and it's often wet in the spring and fall. So um, it can be problematic here in areas where we have uh, wet springs and falls. Okay, so like big picture, zoom back out again. Legumes, they do have lower yields than cereals. So um, like maybe half to 75%, something like that. Um, they can tolerate a narrow, narrower range of moisture, so they really don't like having their feet wet. Um, but I mean, they can tolerate dry spells, but not to the extent that something like a C4 cereal can, um, which is really well adapted to be able to do that. Um, I, and I should point out that they're, they're much more sensitive to wet than dry. Um, of course, be thinking about how to use cool versus warm season ones because they, how, how they plug into a crop rotation just differs based on that um, life history. Um, how you're gonna affect your overall yields, um, and also consider that summer ones, again, are gonna be yielding better than winter ones, and that, again, fall planted is better than spring planted from a yield perspective. Uh, by and large, legumes are less winter hardy than cereals. So if you think about, like, you can get away with planting a really late season wheat or rye or whatever for grain or for a cover crop, but you can't have a hard winter and plant a legume late. It just will not make it. Um, for whatever reason, they, it actually helps to give them a nurse crop. If you want to get a legume through the winter, you can throw some a cereal in there, some oats or something. Um, for some reason, just having that extra plant in there allows them to make it through the winter a little bit better. So whether that would be a useful tip, I don't know. Um, but it certainly helps with winter survival. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about how beans grow. Um, so beans and other legumes are pretty much exclusively naturally vining. Um, so like the bush type beans or whatever kind of legume crop is, are out there are well bred, right? So we spend a lot of time breeding the vining habit out of our beans. However, um, of course we don't exclusively have um, just bush varieties and so there's this gradient. It's, it's not like you know these discrete units of one type or another, but it's a gradient. However, we broke, we broke it conveniently into four categories um, to try to better understand them. And so this is one through four. Number one is just a bush variety. It's the only true determinate one. All the others are more or less indeterminate, with two being sort of indeterminate, but it, has, it vines a little bit up at the top, but it stays narrow and it stays short. It doesn't really vine a whole lot. Type three, um, it's fully indeterminate, and then it just grows up and it lays on the ground. It, it doesn't vine, which is really interesting, or it doesn't climb, I should say. So it vines up and lays down, which this is probably my least favorite bean because it grows up and then lays on the ground and then they germinate or rot. Um, so try to avoid those if you can. And then indeterminate climbing ones like you know your scarlet runners or something. Um, so this is a really small picture of what that might look like, right? So bush, uh, we're, this is our narrow vining type two. This would be that one that lays down on the ground, prostrate, and then this is somebody growing a field of viners, one stake per plant kind of a thing. Um, four, four different categories, and like I mentioned, it's nice to be able to favor those first two. Um, okay, taking a, another step back, so legumes have lower nutrient requirement needs than cereals do, and so they don't need all that nitrogen because they can fix a lot of their own. and so. I'm assuming everybody here is aware of nitrogen fixation, which is hugely important um, from a crop management perspective and just being able to make these things work. Um, that's what probably gives them the ability to have as high a protein content as they do have um, and really helps you out, the farmer, if you want to grow them and not have to have that added input. So I happen to love legumes for that, that they can save you a buck um, and of course reduce like the energy it requires to make that nitrogen. Um, 
in whatever form that is. So they have lower total phosphorus and potassium needs, but not like lower per plant or per pound of grain. And so that's just basically a fact that, or due to the fact that they're lower yielding. But they do, so you're not gonna have to put down as much total, but um, they're not necessarily more efficient than cereals are using them. And I would say that's owing to their relatively higher nutrient content, right? So they're more nutritious for you, so they, they kind of need a little bit more, but not total. Um, so here's a, that same table, but with these legumes added at the end. So um, this is the yields column in pounds per acre. You can see we're at like three to 9,000 pounds. And here we're at like 1,500 to 3,000 pounds. So a fraction of the cereals. However, if you go and look over at protein, protein content is twice as much. Um, and then for, for soybeans, we're talking like high 30s for protein, which is really impressive. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it has a really high oil content, which is really uncommon for legumes. Okay, so pseudo cereals. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about pseudo cereals. I haven't worked with them a ton, and they're not, they're not grown very often. So we'll just spend a little bit of time talking and thinking about them. So buckwheat is an example of a pseudo cereal, right? Everybody probably has seen buckwheat. Um, buckwheat is actually a cool crop. I'm a, I'm a fan of buckwheat. Um, it's relatively high in protein and has, it's a great uh, floral resource for pollinators, right? Very pretty flowers, like buckwheat fields are really attractive. Um, and, you know, it grows a little bit of grain that is tasty and relatively high in protein. Um, amaranth would be another example. So amaranth is probably often thought of as like a, a famine food of, you know, the days of yore. And, um, it's got these tiny little seeds. There's been very little breeding attention that's gone into this crop. Um, it can become really weedy if you give it a chance. And um, it's high in, high in energy, high calorically, but low in protein. Um, and this is that plant. Uh, this is probably just a, a uh, ornamental variety, but you get the idea. They look approximately like this. Uh, the seeds are not held very well in there. So when you're handling it, let's say you're harvesting it or threshing it or whatever, man, your seeds are gonna go everywhere. Um, something to consider, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so also quinoa. Everybody has heard of quinoa, I'm sure, and other quinopods. And so quinoa is its own quinopod. This is in the, um, I guess it's, now these are in the same family, but they, these used to be different. Um, goosefoot, lamb's quarters, right? Um, quinoa is a cool season crop. I, sh I should also add that amaranth is a warm season and buckwheat's a cool season, but we'll talk more about that in a second. Quinoa is a cool season crop. It doesn't like heat. Uh, it's grown in the Andes for a reason um, and in the Rockies, I think, more recently. I wouldn't expect it to do well here. It's day length sensitive. It needs short days, so the higher latitude you get at or the lower whatever hemisphere you're in, um, the less success you have with it. So it can be a really challenging crop. I think people are trying to breed day length sensitivity out of it and then maybe make it more warm adapted. But um, right now, the crop that, crops that we do have are probably not worth messing around with at this point. So among grains that we're talking about today, they're the, they're the lowest yielding. However, they haven't really had much breeding effort go into them. So I see a lot of room for improvement in them, especially buckwheat. People are, are working on buckwheat um, with its like relatively high protein content and good flavors and that kind of thing. Um, and it fits in really well as a short season crop. We'll talk about crop rotation in a minute. Um, Relatively more nutritious, more nutritious than cereals, that's for sure. Um, so like protein and quinoa have, have higher protein contents, amaranth doesn't. Um, quinoa has a, a, all the essential amino acids, right? So we, we like quinoa for that. It's a complete protein, um, but it's not nearly as high as like a legume is. Uh, lots of micronutrients like you find in legumes, um, but I mentioned this earlier, please be warned, they can become weedy. They're hard to, hard to work with, hard to manage. Those plants have a lot of seeds on them and then, um, you know, they're not like held very well on the plant, so they, they go everywhere. Um, and also when, you're, when you are harvesting, your yields are, you lose a considerable portion of your yield, just goes on the ground um, because they're not easy to work with. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about buckwheat in detail because I think that's the one that applies to most of us here. Um, so buckwheat is a, a really interesting crop. It doesn't like nutrient rich situations. If you try to grow it on like a really good cornfield, it's just, it's not gonna do well. For whatever reason, 
it likes poor soils. And so it's really good to follow after a cereal crop that's just sucked a bunch of nitrogen or other nutrients out of there and can fit into like, you know, marginal land where you otherwise aren't doing anything with, if you were like willing to till it up and put some in there, that kind of thing. Um, it's a really diverse crop. It's, it goes, if you plant it and then you'll be able to harvest in like 12 weeks at most, um, which is a short period of time. So it fits in nicely, you know, if you just have a little gap in time and it's the right time of year, you can do it. Um, prefers cooler temperatures, so it's not a, a crop that you're gonna plant like in June and have any success with it. It'll try to set seed as quickly as it can. What you wanna do is plant it when it, the nights are starting to get cool, like right now actually would be a good time. Um, and it, it can kinda take its time and it just kinda, it likes being out there in the cool, grows up real big, puts on more vegetation and then makes a lot more seed compared to like if you plant it in the summer, it's just like bolt straight to seed. Um, it is frost tender though, so it's like people call it a cool season crop, um, but it's not gonna make it through a frost. However, that attribute is actually really important because it's indeterminate. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't uh, mature evenly, right? So like at any point in time, if it's flowering or setting seed, you might go out there and cut it and you got half the seed that's ready and half that's like just barely setting seed. So um, you can either go out there and cut it yourself, kill it, or let a frost do that for you. So that's actually a, a common management technique for buckwheat is to uh, plant it like early fall, late summer, let it grow, let a frost kill it, and then you can go out and deal with it. Does that make sense? Like I mentioned, it, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, 10 to 12 weeks fits in well. Um, we talked about pollinators. Um, so yeah, nutrient requirements. We're talking like 25 pounds of nitrogen, 15, potassium 20 phosphorus, I mean 15 phosphorus and 20 potassium. Very, very low compared to all the other crops we've already talked about. Um, and we'll see how that can fit into crop rotation in a little while. Okay, so oilseed crops. Um, I think these are important to consider, right? Like accessible to the small scale grower, you might be able to grow some livestock feed, some useful livestock feed, or maybe you're interested in pressing out oil. I don't know. Um, but okay, so like I said, high oil content, you know, 15 to 30% oil, you can squeeze a lot out. Uh, it usually requires milling and then heating in some way if you're not, if you're not doing like chemical extraction. Um, and there are small scale units set up specifically for this. I'm sure they're pricey. Um, or you can kind of work on this sort of thing at home. Um, so they aren't necessarily used as a grain, but a lot of them pull double duty, right? So like sunflowers, for example, you know, you can use as an oil seed crop or you can just eat it yourself. Um, peanuts, you know, you can use for oil or you can eat as peanuts. Um, so, and I mentioned this earlier, they're really cool because you get two products out of them. You press out oil and then you can use that. And then it's a really high value livestock feed because, you know, 20% of the oil is gone and now you're, percent protein is just like gone up a bunch. Um, so that meal is the desirable product there. Of course, you can just eat them, um, process into something that you else that you want to eat otherwise, right? You like peanut butter, you like making hummus, you make some tahini, um, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's talk about the actual crops. So there are a few different categories, I would say, or bre breaking it down, if we were to break it down by plant family, Legumes have two big guys, right? So we got soybean, we all know what soybean looks like. Um, and we got peanuts, right? So I, I've only tried to grow peanuts a few times unsuccessfully, so I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about peanut management, but they're cool, they grow on the ground, right? Um, many different kinds of peanuts, some are oil varieties and then some are for other purposes, like just straight eating. Um, and then some that are kinda dual purpose. Brassicas, so we're talking like canola, right? Everybody's probably seen a field of canola those bright yellow flowers in the spring, like really pretty. Um, they actually make the highest, in, in a temperate region, canola is gonna be your highest oil producer. Um, higher, a little bit higher than soybean. Super productive crop, but the oil, you know, like is maybe questionable in terms of nutritional value. Uh, it has like some, maybe some residual of a particular acid that's poisonous. It's supposed to have been bred out. Um, and then I, I wanna say that the, amino acid profile is not really good. So like a, a omega six to three is not uh, what you'd wanna be consuming. Um, however, 
Camelina, which is like a, a little known and little grown one. Another brassica, looks a lot like canola. These are the little seeds here. I think you get like one or two seeds per pod. Um, is a, a lower yielding oil, but um, has an amazingly high omega-3 content. Um, so it's one of the few vegetable oils that you can buy that uh, the ratio is actually in the omega-3 favor. And so there's more omega-3s than omega-6s. Um, if, you do, if you are thinking about that, you know, there's sort of like some health consideration there. Um, this, this is a healthy one to help balance out the rest of our diet, you know, where it's like super high in omega-6s or omega-9s. Um, just one way to think of it. Okay, so asters, everybody knows sunflower, right? Um, really cool crop. I think these are just amazing, you know, they're like really, really big flowers. You know, these things get this big at the top of this uh, little bitty stalk and they make this great abundance of seed. Um, and they do a pretty good job of oil production per acre, but not nearly as high as canola or soybean. Um, the, the, the oil is not necessarily nutritious, but uh, it is oil nonetheless. Uh, safflower, that's a, a cool season crop, mostly grown in northern areas. We don't really grow it around here, but I wanted to throw it in there. Just as a point of reference, um, looks a little bit like a thistle, and it has a, a nutritional profile a lot like sunflower does. Um, doesn't yield as much either. Okay, so then there's two other categories of oil seeds that didn't really fit into those. And so one is flax. I'm sure everybody knows linseed oil or flaxseed oil. Um, really cool plant, kind of a wimp. Not very competitive with weeds, uh, but it does have a low nutrient requirement and it grows well on poor soils, a lot like buckwheat does. Um, you just have to be very careful about weed management. Um, also, if you were considering growing this, it's, it's not nearly as easy to thresh out and get like a final product as every single other one we've talked about. Um, for whatever reason, inside that little seed head there, there's like six, or ten, six to ten seeds and it's kind of like oily and sticky and there's all this like thin papery stuff that holds it together and it, it's, um, it's difficult to get the seed separated. I think you need some specialized equipment. So um, I don't think it would be impossible to come up with it as a small scale producer, but be aware that you'd be up against that. You might grow a field of flax and then not be able to deal with it. Um, sesame, sesame is a, a cool crop. Um, again, in its own plant family, it grows this tall erect stem. It has these little white flowers that stick out to the side. They form these pods and then you get, you know, yellower or black sesame seeds that then can be turned into something like tahini or whatever. Um, I wouldn't expect sesame to do well in North Carolina, but for you Georgia growers, it grows well wherever cotton grows well, is what they say. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, okay, let's talk about crop rotation. So I'm sure everybody here knows how to rotate crops. Um, but let's think a little bit about how we can make these three things fit together. So obviously you don't want to follow a warm season cereal with a warm season cereal, but it's not uncommon to follow like a, a warm season with a cool season cereal, right? Like soy, soy bean corn, soybean, wheat, for example. Um, but preferably you're going to be just alternating or running through this, um, this sequence or going alternating between cereal and legume without actually having them touch in time the same plant family. That would be ideal, not always possible. Um, so that's just from like, let's say we're thinking about diseases, you know, we're thinking about diseases build up. If you want to think about weed management, right, so if, if there are warm season weeds and there are cool season weeds, cool season an or winter annuals and summer annuals. Um, the winter annuals do well in a wheat crop, right? That you plant in the fall and then they do their thing. But the summer annuals are not going to make it in a wheat crop because you harvest the wheat before they set seed, right? So um, you can think about choosing when to go with a cool season or a warm season one based on your weed population, you know, like what your weed pressure is. If you have a, an a winter annual problem, then maybe avoid um, a cool season, whatever, cool season legume or cereal for a little bit of time and you can just throw in warm season ones um, or vice versa, right? Just kind of flip that around. It's good to alternate back and forth because you can slowly diminish the weed seed population, right? So whatever's down there in the weed seed bank, it, it pops out of the ground when it can. And then, you know, if, if it's a winter annual and you um, are growing a summer crop and you harvest it 
kill that winter annual, right, you've just depleted that weed seed from the seed bank, just a little bit. And theoretically, if your weed management is good over time, then you can run that seed bank down. Of course, one plant makes like thousands or millions of seeds, so it's easy to replenish, but that's the idea, right? If you alternate, you might be able to be successful um, and you're a stickler for weeds. Okay, so cool season versus warm season offers opportunities for double cropping as well. So let's say you, um, you pull out a winter crop in June, then you might have the opportunity to throw in a, um, a short season whatever, cereal legume, be it soybean uh, or maybe a short season corn variety. You might be able to throw that in in June and, and pull a crop off by the end of the year. So double cropping is great, right? You're not relying just on one crop per year, per area. So trying to work with short season crops has that advantage and buckwheat can help fill that really well. Um, this is kind of on the back side of that, but let's say you grew a spring crop. So you planted it in March and you harvested it in July um, or August. Then in early August, you can throw in buckwheat and you can be pulling off buckwheat before it's time to plant wheat or whatever um, and kind of get a double crop in that way. So buckwheat offers this like really nice flexibility to fill a gap in a crop rotation. Um, so these crops work really well with cover crops, right? So most of our cover crops are grain crops anyway um, that we grow in one way or another to just like for biomass. Um, and so over time, I think we've worked out pretty good ways to get them in the ground and manage them so that they can provide benefits in a cereal or, or excuse me, a grain rotation. Um, whether you're rolling that down or tilling it under or just throwing buckwheat in in the middle of summer, whatever it is. Um, and we can talk more about cover crops if you want. We can take questions on that too. Um, so here's just an example of what you might do over the course of three to four years. Maybe this is a little bit small for you guys in the back, but you're one, two, three, four. Um, if you were to like, let's say you were gonna plant sorghum, you might wanna precede that with a winter legume like hairy vetch or crimson clover so that you can kill that down. That's just a cover crop, kill it down, you get a bunch of nitrogen, throw a cereal in for the summer, and then you get a lot of that nitrogen uh, going to the sorghum and then, you know, less that you have to apply. That's the idea. You pull that off, maybe, maybe after you pull that, pull that out of the ground, you can throw in a rye cover crop, which would precede something like dry bean or another summer, uh, summer legume. That's harvested in the fall. Maybe you want to grow wheat after that or some other cool season cereal. Um, that comes off in, let's say, June. Then you can throw buckwheat in after, actually this, I should mention, after you pull out wheat, is a great opportunity, if you're cool with tillage, to do some seed bank, weed seed bank work. So you can, instead of just leaving that totally fallow, you can prepare a seed bed, get all the seeds to come up, and then you hit it with a disc or whatever you have, kill all the weed seeds that come up, do that as many times as you can before it's time to plant the next crop. So that's like a great opportunity this little, this little gap in management where like nothing else really fits. Um, go ahead and work on your weed seed bank there. And then in early August or middle August, you can throw in buckwheat. Um, buckwheat might come out in time to plant a winter pea. Although, you know, I would say maybe um, peas need to be planted earlier than cereals, a winter cereal. So maybe consider a winter cereal for that instead, but whatever works. Um, if pea preceded corn, a short season corn crop, then you'd get a nice dose of nitrogen from the pea as well as the pea grain. Um, and in general, people say like per bushel of pea or soybean that you can pull out of the ground, you get a pound of nitrogen. So if you pull out a, a 50 bushel crop of whatever, of soybean or pea, you get fit maybe 50 units, 50 pounds of nitrogen for the next crop, kind of like the crop, the nitrogen credit. Um, so that's a, Eventually, I think it's important to start putting numbers on these things um, so that you can maybe better understand when things aren't working out well, what's going on. Um, so I'd say, yeah, that's, that's about it for an example rotation. Okay, let's look at productivity real quick, just to, just to make sure we have our heads wrapped around who's boss and who's doing, who's underperforming. Um, okay, so this is uh, nine crops, right? So we've got corn, sorghum, wheat, oat. Those are our cereals. Four legumes, bean, soybean, pea, and lentil, because these are my favorite. And then that one pseudo-cereal buckwheat. And this is uh, 
pounds of grain per acre. Oh, and you know what? I, th I went ahead and put in the, this is like a, what you would expect to be a good bushels per acre, and just this graph is converting it to pounds per acre. Um, and the way that I have this data set up is the, the top of the bar is like if you were man if you were a guy who's been doing this or girl who's been doing this for a while, um, and you were doing a really good job at it, you were, you had your management dialed in. The top of top of the bar is like an average, excellent yield, and then there's a, a bar that's going to be down here. This is like if you do a really bad job, if you don't have your weed management or your nutrient management under control, it's going to be a bust. Um, and then you'll see there's going to be a dot in the middle that's kind of like, yeah, you, you're getting pretty good at it. Um, and so corn, you can see, is king here, at producing like, you know, maybe around 9,000 pounds of the acre. That's a whole lot, especially when you compare it to little old buckwheat at 1,000 pounds of the acre. Um, but he's great for other reasons. Uh, and then, you know, it kind of tapers off really quickly. Sorghum, not nearly as productive. You can see that corn is just... Corn dominates, and I think that's why we grow so darn much of it. Um, wheat, these cool season crops, they inherently can't produce as much as these warm season crops, it would seem. Um, and so you might be able to pull off a 60 bushel crop, which is like three and a half thousand. That's pretty good. But notice, you know, that these lower bars are, are pretty low. So if you do a bad job with your corn, you, you know, you might only get, um, I can't calculate the bushels in my head, but just a little over. 2,000 pounds of the acre. And if you scale that down to whatever scale you're working on, it's, it might be a pretty small quantity, especially as you work your way down uh, the, the yield gradient here. Okay, so for the legumes, soybean is always going to be the best. That one's had the most breeding attention. Um, it seems to be inherently higher yielding. It's just like uh, a, its own trait. Um, next to that is pea. I, I see actually a lot of potential in pea. Um, it's not, it's actually not really not commonly grown here and people are like sort of exploring its use, but I'm excited about it. It's a cool season crop. I wouldn't expect it to, to do well every year, but if you think about what, what has to go into processing, let's say, let's say you want to um, feed soybeans to your animals versus feed peas to your animals. The, the yields are basically equivalent. Protein's a little bit higher here. But this requires a processing step. You can't just feed soybeans to your animals. You have to, usually what's done is you roast out the oils, and that oil just kind of goes wherever, um, and is collected and dealt with in some other way. So you, I mean, you kind of get two products out of it, but the vast majority of soybean processing is not very efficient, and um, it's costly, right? So there's this added step in processing soybeans that you don't have to do with peas. So I'm a big fan of peas if you're thinking about feeding it to animals um, or feeding yourself. Beans don't seem to do as well. You know, you might get a good crop would be 2,000 pounds of the acre. They're delicious and they're beautiful and there's all kinds of variety, but they just don't perform as well. So if you're thinking about making a buck off of them, um, maybe go for, you know, some really attractive ones that you can get high dollar for retail or something. And then lentils, you know, lentils aren't very productive. 1,500 pounds of the acre would be a good yield. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a really good yield. Um, in my experience of growing them in the east, it's like not nearly that good, probably that blue bar. Um, but I think it's an awesome crop and worth giving a try. So I included it. Um, buckwheat, little old buckwheat over there, not doing so well, but um, fits really well into little windows in a crop rotation. Okay, so if, if this is just pounds per acre, um, which might not be a really relevant unit for you. Let's talk about like, let's say your unit is a thousand square feet. You're thinking of like, you're thinking on thousand square foot levels, then maybe here's some numbers that you might get out of it. So like, let's say you put in a thousand square feet of corn, you know, that's 20 feet by 50 feet. It's not very big. You might be able to get 200 pounds out of it if you were to manage it really well. That's kind of, I mean, I think that's a lot compared to say like, you know, a small amount of buckwheat or a small amount of beans where you're not even making a bushel out of it. Um, However, a bushel of beans to me is a lot more valuable than a bushel of corn or many bushels of corn. And we'll talk about the nutrient aspects of that here in a little while. Um, but so is, is this a more, a more meaningful unit for you? You can see like ac actually what you might be getting. Um, I also just went ahead and broke it into tenth of an acre in case you work in like fractions of an acre, um, which is the same thing as dividing the other numbers by ten, but you get the idea. Um, 
So, you know, if you're whatever scale you're working at, you can get several hundred pounds with just a small amount of land of these high yielding crops, and then, you know, like, you know, up to 100 pounds, small amount of land, lower yielding crops. I think it's great. Um, the trick is, and we'll talk about this, hopefully we'll get to go out to the field. The trick is doing this whole thing efficiently, which is our whole management piece where we got the rest of the day to talk about, um, and having perhaps some equipment to help you do that, right? So like, maybe you can work really good with a scythe, but it also really helps to have something to thresh it out for you, instead of doing it by hand. Although there are many like low technology ways of doing that. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about growing nutrients. So having worked in grain production for a long time where the majority of that grain goes to animals um, and wondering, wondering if it would be useful to think about how we could reorient what we grow to what we actually need to eat instead of feeding it to something else. Um, and so I was doing some research, I worked at Penn State for a while, I was doing some research to kind of like quantify that. Um, so like, how much nutrients can you produce in an acre? Name your nutrient, you know, if, I mean, we could talk calories, protein, magnesium, any nutrient, right? You could just plug it into a model and spit out some numbers um, with the idea that it would be really useful to know what's most efficient from a land, I mean, from a acreage perspective, right? So like, what crop should you grow if you want to maximize protein production or if you want to maximize micronutrient production, those kind of things. Um, so we went ahead and did a little bit of math to work that out. And I'm going to show you a graph here that, so on the left is going to be yield. And on the right is going to be the calories in that yield per acre. This is all per acre. For those four cereals, the four legumes, buckwheat, and for three animal products, beef, pork, and chicken. Um, and then these are all calculated basically by like, what amount of land does it take to bring a beef cow to slaughter? Um, or you know, a bunch of chickens to slaughter. What amount of land does it require? What, you know, if you're growing grains or you're putting them on pasture, we work that whole thing into the model um, to see what shook out, right? And so this is, this is how it looks, so let me explain. And by the way, this is, this is dry yield, right? So um, because meat is very wet, we have to convert, you know, and it would be very high as a wet value, we convert it to a dry value so that we're kind of like all on an even playing field. Um, and this is what it looks like. So it looks exactly like the yields we saw earlier, right? So um, corn doing really well, the legumes doing okay, tapering off as we go to the right. And then these three animal products yield relatively low, I would say, um, just based on the, uh, the amount of land it takes to grow them. Um, it seems like the smaller animal you are, the more efficient you are at, at making meat. Um, and so I would actually say that the We'll get to the protein piece in a second, but chicken is surprisingly competitive with some legumes, um, which I was surprised by. But if, if you were some starving person and you wanted to maximize your calories, this tells me you should be growing, these little red dots are calories produced per acre. Um, you know, work with cereals if you want to do calories. Um, as you move your way down here, calories drop off on a per acre uh, unit, but of course calories aren't the only thing we want to be thinking about, right? Actually, I, none of us are probably calorie deficient, um, and we need to, be, need to be thinking about like other nutrients. And so there's a ton of micronutrients that we could think about, but it's actually not very easy to analyze or I haven't figured out how to do it. Um, so I wanted to look at, sorry, um, I want to look at protein. So like what's going to produce protein most efficiently on a per acre basis? And so this is a graph of the blue bars are per pounds of protein produced per acre, and then the red dots are just kind of for reference, it's the percent protein. And so the way we got this is just by multiplying the percent protein by the yield, right? Um, and so as you can see, you can, I mean, you can still grow a ton of protein per acre with cereals. And then soybeans sort of like almost off the charts. Um, and then beef and pork are just so-so. But look at chicken over here. Chicken's doing pretty good, right? He's um, equivalent to dry bean. I mean, and this is, this is assuming that this chicken's getting fed some high grain corn diet. Um, but impressive, if you ask me. Um, and I mean, I, I love to eat meat. So I appreciate that these guys are over here doing their thing. 
Um, but if we are thinking about trying to match what we need to eat with what we grow, this indicates to me that you know, legumes can really fill that role very well. Um, okay, so now about this over here. So that's a ton of protein per acre, even though it's a low protein crop. So that's not necessarily the best way to represent that information, right? So like, you're not just gonna eat a bunch of corn and get, your, get all the protein that you need. Nobody wants to do that. Um, so maybe another way of thinking about this is to represent it as um, you have certain protein requirements. I use USDA reference values for this. You could use whichever ones you want. But let's say you needed to eat a certain amount of food, of each of these foods to meet your protein requirements, right? So you would have to eat, and also over here the red dots are calories produced, I mean calories eaten to meet that protein requirement, which I actually think is the more important metric. The takeaway is that if you eat a low protein source and you only ate corn, you, you would have to eat 2,000 calories to get what you need, right? So nobody wants to eat just corn all day. Um, but as, and of course corn fills, corn and these other cereals fill their own sort of niche with our food culture, and I am happy that they do. But take note that like as you move over here into the legumes, um, because they have a relatively high concentration of protein um, and they're land efficient at producing it, you can, meet your you can meet your protein needs with like a lot less calories. So this tells me that, you know, eh, let's not, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about growing as much cereal, cereals as we do, and start thinking about legume production as like a, a great viable way to be growing protein on a per acre basis um, in order to reduce, let's say, land use for agriculture or to meet, you know, the growing demand for food in the future. And so my perspective on this is just sort of like a, a big picture food systems thing, like maybe we can, bet, we can do a better job of matching what we need to eat with what we grow by doing this sort of work and just thinking critically about it. Let's talk about animal feed. Here's an animal feed example. Let's like kind of take this, take this back down to earth. So um, you can, you definitely can grow supplemental feed for your animals, whatever it is. Um, and if you were very efficient at it, you might be able to grow all of it and you had a small flock or herd. Um, definitely, like we saw earlier, there are some pretty serious economies of scale that you achieve as you become more mechanized and bigger. So it's a good idea to think about mechanization if you are trying to grow all of your feed. Otherwise, you're just gonna be inherently limited and you're gonna be busy all the time. Um, and so it's, it's of course up to you. But so I, I put together a little egg layer example. So um, more graphs. If, if let's say you have a flock of chickens and you wanna feed them any of these five grains that we've talked about earlier. Um, I just did a little bit of math. I, I'll admit I know very little about animal production. So um, I did my best to calculate this. And so if you wanna meet your, your chickens or your birds, protein and caloric requirements over the course of a year and average it out over like a three-year lifespan, um, the numbers that you would get for pounds of grain per bird per year could be broken out by different crops, right? So you, and I, just for fun, I made a multi-grain diet. You know, I sort of balanced out all these to meet the protein and caloric requirements. Um, I did a, a, what I would call a high protein diet of oats because they're, that protein in oats is actually higher than what a chicken seems to require on average, um, and then a third diet of like, and so that oat is sort of a low yielding one, and then the corn and pea is a high yielding one, so like basically maximizing, um, making, making the best use of area to grow feed for chickens, right? Um, and so this is just pounds of grain, you know, like based on different nutrient contents of the grain, it's basically 50 pounds per bird per year is what that worked out to, with very little variation. However, if because these things yield differently, if you convert that to a, a per acre basis um, or per square foot is the unit that I chose to use here, and you look at each of these three diets, you can see that the, the multi-grain diet, you know, it, it is what it is, it's a mix. Um, and so, you know, you might need 750 square feet to feed a bird for a year. Oats, you're gonna need more, you're gonna need almost a thousand. However, if you go the high yielding route with corn and pea, you cut that in half. So, if you do choose to maximize, um, sorry, maximize use of space by growing these high yielding crops, you can do a pretty decent job, 500 square foot to feed a bird. I mean, 500 square foot's 
really small. Um, and then, you know, multiply by your flock numbers, something like that. So if you had 20 chickens, uh, you know, do the math and you might not need to grow that much corn and pea. And these are broken out by um, square footage per crop. Does that all make sense? So it can be done. Do, redo the math for whatever animal you want to do. Um, I think, so chickens, this is egg production. Uh, you know, for meat production, it would maybe be a little bit more efficient. Uh, for all other animals, it's going to be less efficient, I would guess. Ooh. Okay. Um, any questions? I'd like to take a walk over to the field and talk about management for the rest of the day. Um, so what I'd like to do is take questions if anybody has them and then take a little break and then we can walk over to the field, walk over to the field. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll dig into management details over there. Questions? Yes. Are you going to go into uh, where you can buy seeds at, so good places to buy seed? If you use an, a non-patented variety, you can save and plant again. Um, and there are, I mean, there's, the web is a great resource for finding open pollinated seeds, of course, and there are companies dedicated specifically to that. Most seed companies, we'll talk actually about this out in the field a little bit, but um, most seed companies who are doing their own breeding work are going to be producing seeds that are a lot more productive than the open pollinated varieties that are available. And many, many of those are like, once you buy them, you're allowed to replant them, as far as I understand it. Um, if there were patents and stuff, I mean, you could always check with them, but I would, I would think that the vast majority of um, seeds you would buy, you could replant, with the exception of any hybrids that are no longer going to be hybrids. But um, not, all, not all these crops are hybrids. So good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's take a break.